Hello and welcome to another lecture. Today we're going to go over these questions and answers related to the arterial system and I hope you do a great job, all right? I know you have been studying and learning all of this, so it's going to be a good day for you, all right? Perfect. Let's begin with this first question. And which vessel joins the deep plantar artery to form the plantar arch? It's going to give you a few seconds and let's see how it goes. The deep plantar artery to form the plantar arch. I'm just going to give you a clue. The deep plantar artery, uh, artery is coming from the dorsalis pedis, which is coming from the anterior tip. And this one is going to join one of the branches of the posterior tip. Okay, those branches are medial planner or lateral planner. What's the one that is going to join with the deep planner arteries? So, and the answer, hopefully, I hope you get it fine, is the lateral planner. Perfect. Good job. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's put some intensity to this. Let's put some intensity. And which statement is most likely related to claudication? A. Pain appears after a short work exercise, exercise and does not subside with rest. Pain usually happens at night while the patient is sleeping and subsides with rest. Pain is predictable, it's reproducible, and affects one or more group of muscles. Pain appears while the patient is supine and relieves with the tendon position of the leg. Just gonna give you a few seconds and see how it goes. All right, and I hope your answer was C at this time. The pain is predictable, it can be reproduced, and affects one or more group of muscles. Remember, claudication is a pain that goes away when the activity that is producing it is stopped. All right. So, um, some of you know the A, the item A could be the most confusing one because it says pain appears of the short work exercise, yes, but does not subside with rest, no, that part is false. So, remember the questions that you're going to have in your test, they have what we call good distractors. So, you have to read all these questions and look for the best option, but also a good technique is answer your question before going to the options and then once you find the options you say oh perfect I got it sometimes you have those double thinking questions that you have to take two steps or sometimes three steps in order to get to the perfect answer let's keep going this way which disease is most likely characterized by fixed ischemia it's ischemia that is constantly present It's going to give you a few seconds this time. And I hope your answer was C, secondary raynets. All right, this one is the, that happens when the patient has a thromboangitis obliterans or Berger's disease. It affects men around the 30 years old, all right? And the other side, the primary raynets, or raynets syndrome, or raynets disease, it affects women. And this is caused by stress, stress, or cold weather most of the time. So this is a basospastic, um, uh, you know, response of the vessels to this stress or to this cold weather, and that goes away. All right, it's not constant. It's not fixed ischemia at this time. All right, what do you most likely suspect in a young patient? with right leg swelling and low ABI values. And I think this question, use the um, elimination technique, it's gonna help you. Okay, A, entrapment syndrome, compartment syndrome, Lurisha syndrome, and Raynaud's syndrome. 
but there's leg swelling, low ABI values, that means the arteries are being affected, the flow has been affected, there's arterial insufficiency, you have to look for something that gives you swelling and arterial insufficiency at the same time. And that's what I'm telling you, the elimination technique is going to help you here. So I hope your answer this time was compartment syndrome. Remember, the treatment for election of the compartment syndrome will be the fasciotomy, which is basically removing the muscle fascia and that will decompress, you know, the compartment. And, you know, if, if this is not done in the proper time, you know, that is critical, this is an emergency, uh, this compartment syndrome could lead to necrosis, all right? I hope you're remembering all of this. All right, perfect. Perfect, let's keep going. Which pathologic, which pathologic event is most likely related to this sonographic image? We're gonna take a look at this sonographic image and then this is two steps question. You need to know what's going on in the picture. All right. So this is a huge, Triple A, this is a triple A, this is one aortic, one abdominal aortic aneurysm. Popliteal artery aneurysm for A, B, entrapment syndrome, C, blue toe syndrome, D, renal artery thrombosis. What do you think? I'm just going to give you a few seconds for you to answer and see how it goes. Okay, remember that sometimes a little piece of a thrombus can detach or a little piece of a plaque and then can go to the distal circulation and that causes something that we call the blue toe syndrome. So I hope your answer was C at this time. All right, let's keep going. I know you're doing well. I know you're understanding all of this. What is the clear, what is the clear disadvantage of the analog Doppler? A, high velocities tend to be overestimated. B, low velocities tend to be underestimated. C, signal is easily affected by noise. And this place is very sensitive compared to the spectral Doppler. What do you think? What do you think at this time? It's going to be a few seconds right now to answer. And I hope your answer was C at this time. All right? Signal is easily affected by noise. Remember, high velocities tend to be tend to be underestimated and low velocities tend to be overestimated and the display is less sensitive compared to that from the spectral Doppler. Okay, good job. Which is the arrow pointing to at this time? Fortward flow in diastole, reverse flow in diastole, fortward flow in systole, minimum diastolic velocity. What do you think? What's the best answer at this time? You need to look for the best answer at this time. And I hope your answer was at this time, A, forward flow in diastole, all right? This is a triphasic waveform that you see in the analog Doppler. Perfect. Let's keep going this way. And now, which ABI value range is most likely related to claudication symptoms? It's going to give you a few seconds. This is something that you need to remember and don't mind. All right. And the answer, I hope, was 0.5 to 0.9. Perfect. That's the uh, ABI value range for claudication. Let's get this way. Which is the value for the left ABI based on this data right here? Right blood pressure is 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. Left blood, left blood pressure is 130 over 80. Right posterior tibial uh, blood pressure is 110. And left posterior tibial blood pressure is at 100. All right. So how do you get the ABI? Remember the brachial pressure that you're going to use. The brachial pressure for reference is going to be the highest one. So it should be 130. And then you're going to use the left blood pressure at the PTA at this time. Okay, and that will be 100 over 130, right? That's what you're looking for. And I hope your answer this time was 0.77. Good job. I know you're going well.
Perfect. All right, let's take a look at this question in here. Which sequence is correct when obtaining the Doppler segmental pressures? Okay, right brachial pressure, right high thigh, left brachial pressure, left high thigh. B, right brachial pressure, left brachial pressure, right high thigh, left high thigh. C, right brachial pressure, left brachial pressure, right ankle, right calf. D, right brachial pressure, left ankle, right ankle, left high thigh. Remember, the pressure should be obtained first, both brachials, and then you go from distal to proximal to avoid the reactive hyperemia of the previous cough. Keep that in mind, and then you'll get your answer. I'll give you a few seconds for you to answer and see how it goes. And I hope your answer this time was C, perfect. Let's keep going, you're doing great. And now let's take a look at this one. It's getting complicated right now. Which statement is more accurate based on this Doppler segmental pressure study? A, bilateral Doppler inflow signals suggest aortoiliac visits. All right, let's keep going. The patient may have right buttock pain and Doppler signals suggesting left femoral popliteal visits. C, bilateral ABI suggest breast pain. D, the patient may have left buttock pain and right posterior thigh signs and symptoms related to claudication. I'm just going to give you a few seconds for this one so you observe what's going on. What's the one that works the best? Remember, you always have to look for the one that works the best in here. Look at the signals on the right side right here. They're monophasic since the beginning, but here is this triphasic. But then the quality of the waveform changes at the level of the left popliteal artery, which is monophasic at this time. This mode here is monophasic since the beginning. This one, well, even though it looks triphasic, it says here biphasic. All right, but it's not so bad. Biphasic, um, it's not so bad, taken in consideration that the, um, all right, uh, the amplitude of the waveform is not so bad at this time. But yes, it is biphasic. It is biphasic. All right, so I hope your answer at this time was B. That's the one that works the best. Good job. You're going perfect. And you have to take my advice when you see this type of question is take a look to all the waveforms. But don't forget to take a look to the pressure values as well. Pressure values that will give you a lot of information, all right? In both legs, uh, the patient should be complaining about claudication. Look at the uh, ABI values in here. 0.61 on the left side, 0.58 on the right side. The right side, of course, has more problems. That's why the ABI has a lower value at this time. Good job. Now, let's keep going. Which is the major limitation of the analog Continuous wave Doppler when evaluating segmental pressures. A. Does not discriminate between biphasic and triphasic quality. It is subject to range specificity, which may signals to um, they uh, they have aliasing to easily aliase. It has troubles discriminating between disease of external iliac artery and common femoral. In calcified vessels, they are going to give you falsely lower segmental pressure values. I'm going to give you a few seconds for you to answer and see how this goes. And I'll take the chance to tell you that remember, you're going to have questions like this and even more in my um, test and study plan for vascular. You're going to have access to this once you get access to the uh, virtual course. All right. And I hope your answer at this time was this one right here. Because remember, the first cough is positioned below the level of the inguinal canal. And right there, signals can be coming from the external iliac or the common femoral. Moving forward, which statement is correct regarding the four coughs method when evaluating segmental pressures? A, high thigh pressures are similar to the highest brachial. What do you think about this one? 
A high thigh pressure 20 millimeters over the highest brachial is suspected to be a normal finding. See an extra pressure value is obtained between the cuff below the knee and the one position of the ankle compared to the three cuffs method. D high thigh pressures are not used as reference due to cuff artifact. What do you think? I'm just going to give you a few seconds as well. And I hope your answer was B at this time. A high thigh pressure, which is 20 millimeters of mercury over the highest brachial, is suspected to be a normal finding due to cough artifact. Yes, and that's, that happens in the four cough method. In the three cough me method, you don't expect this. Moving forward, which is the most likely peripheral arterial disease classification based on this PVR waveform. Is it normal? Is it moderate? Is it severe or is it is this mild? What do you think? Look at the amplitude, look at the peak, look at the rise time or the upstroke, take a look at the down, uh, downstroke and see what's going on. And tell me, what do you think? A few seconds in here. And I hope your answer was mightly abnormal at this time. There's no dichrotic notch, so it's not normal. The amplitude is still um, decent, meaning that, yeah, there's mild disease in here, but there's no dichrotic notch. It cannot be normal. Good job. Which exam modality is most likely used to evaluate healing chances for an arterial ulcer? Remember, we talked about this. It also tells you if the patient is a good candidate for the HBO. And I hope you get the answer. A photoplatysmography or PPG, B platysmography, C transcutaneous oximetry, and D Doppler segmental pressures. And I hope your answer was C at this time. Good job. I know you're doing well. I know you're doing great. Moving forward, how long does it take for the ABI to recover to pre exercise values during a treadmill stress test when single level disease is present? Look at this single level disease is present. What do you think? And I hope your answer at this time was two to six minutes. Yeah, if it takes more time, if it takes more time usually is because there's multiple level disease present. All right, moving forward, which, which test is most likely used to evaluate the patency of the pulmonary arches? Remember, this right here. Okay, and I hope your answer was, All right, the Allen test, perfect, that's the answer, good job, let's keep going, which is an important prerequisite before obtaining the penile brachial index, A, perform a complete abdominal study, B, check the proximal abdominal aorta for aneurysm, C, obtain uh, common femoral artery Doppler signals, in both legs, or D is can the penis for venous valve insufficiency? And I hope your answer at this time was C. Let's keep going. Good job. Which pathology is most likely related to this Doppler waveform in here? I was going to give you a clue. This is what we'll call it to and fro. To and fro. A. AV fistula. B. Pseudoaneurysm. C. Graft failure. D. Subclamian still syndrome. I'm just going to give you another clue. In yan sign. In yan sign. And I hope your answer at this time was B. Good job. You're going perfect. Which diameter is optimal for the GSB grade saphenous vein to be used as an in situ bypass graft? Remember, the GSB should be patent. All right in order to be used as a bypass craft and hopefully your answer was more than two millimeters good job perfect let's keep going now what is the most likely disease location based on this Doppler waveform if you understand hemodynamics of course you're going to be able to answer this look at this this is a TARDIS PARVIS waveform you see this after one is the 
and the problem is in the popliteal artery. So your answer should be, what do you think? I'm just going to give you a few seconds. This is hemodynamics. And hopefully your answer was the superficial femoral artery. So you should see this wave form after the problem, after the stenosis. And, you know, this is happening in the popliteal, which, you know, the popliteal uh, goes after the, or goes distal to the superficial femoral artery. Perfect. Which is the common cause of an in-situ by vein bypass graft stenosis? What do you think? Arthritis, B, intima hyperplasia, C is lichen, lichage, all right, D, atherosclerosis. What do you think? Just going to give you a few seconds for you to think. Just going to give you a clue in here. Universal response of vessels to damage, and the answer is intima hyperplasia. Good job. Let's keep going. And well, this is it. This is it for today. With this, we have finished the arterial system. All right. Hopefully, you learn. You enjoyed all of this. Go over the recordings. Learn all of this, and of course, do questions and answers. Okay. Remember, the capacity to learn is a gift. The ability to learn is a skill, and the willingness to learn is a choice. Thank you for making it today, and I'll see you next time. As always, my pleasure.